we have been working our way through the Gospel of Mark. We've come to chapter 13, and, and uh, we are in what is called the Olivet Discourse. And this is when Jesus was on the Mount of Olives, and he began to explain the end times and what they would be like. And Jesus mentioned to his disciples that the, some of the characteristics were that the intensity of wars and the rumors of wars would get worse and worse. There would, there would be uh, natural disasters and famines, and all of these would intensify as the end draws near, like a mother having contractions. It's hard to pre predict the exact moment that a baby will be born. Uh, but the labor pains that the mom is going through give a clue uh, that the delivery is coming soon. And one of, the, uh, one of the other characteristics, surprisingly, that Jesus said would go from bad to worse, uh, not only on a worldwide global scale, there are a lot of things, but also on a personal level, uh, on a relational level, uh, he said that what would also escalate is betrayal. <clears throat> betrayal is when someone does something wrong. We might say they stab you in the back. Matthew, in his gospel, describes Jesus' words as a time when many will be offended and will betray one another, handing other believers to their persecutors and will hate one another. <clears throat> so knowing that these offensive times are already here and getting worse, the question for us today is how, uh, how can we be patient in the face of betrayal? How can we be gracious when we've been wronged? How, can, how are we supposed to overcome when others are disloyal and unfaithful? And so to answer that, uh, turn with me to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13. And we're also going to end up in other, other gospel, the Gospel of John, the Gospel of Matthew, but this will be our launching pad right here. Uh, Mark chapter 13, verse, starting verse 9 through 13, said, Jesus said, But be on your guard, <clears throat> for they will deliver you over to councils, and you'll be beaten in synagogues, and you'll stand before governors and, and, for, and, and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed, to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand uh, what you are to say, but say whatever is given to you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and put them and have them put to death. And you'll be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Now, keep in mind, what Jesus is describing is taking place during the seven years of tribulation. Right now, we are waiting for the rapture of the church. Uh, before the second coming of Christ, he will first remove his followers from the earth. Then on the earth, there'll be a seven year period of tribulation. And this, this is that specific period that Jesus is describing here. And as that, that period uh, begins, starts to look more and more like our period, those are the clues, the contractions, the indicators that the end is near. And a major, as I mentioned, a major characteristic is this betrayal. And this is uh, what I wanna focus in on today and follow that line of thought because one of the biggest betrayers in all of human history turned out to be one of Jesus' own disciples. His name was Judas Iscariot. Betrayal hurts so deeply because the nature of the treachery comes from someone that you let get close to you. When you trust someone, you uh, don't put up your defenses. Uh, and the more you love them and care for them, the more you let them, the more you let them come in and you let your guard down. And that's how love works. Uh, we risk being more susceptible and vulnerable uh, when you love greatly. We, we risk getting our hearts broken. And that's why betrayal and marriage, for example, hurts so badly because 
this couple promised to be faithful and true before God and all these witnesses. They vowed to be by each other's side through thick and thin. So when one leaves, it's heartbreaking. I've, I've heard some spouses describe it as being worse than death. And it hurts so bad because marriage should be a place, the one place where you can be completely exposed without any inhibitions or any walls up, any defenses. That's the ideal in marriage. And so it's one thing <clears throat> if you're wronged by an enemy. You saw that coming. You expect that from an enemy. But, it, but it's wor a worse betrayal if the enemy pretended to be a friend. And that's what happened to Jesus. On the night before his crucifixion, Jesus was sharing his final meal with his disciples. Among his 12 disciples, Judas was right there. And he was one of the feet that Jesus washed that evening. Uh, John 13, 18 says, I, Jesus said, I am not speaking of all of you. I, I know whom I have chosen. This, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread and has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now before it takes place, that when it, it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I, I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. So Jesus knew that he would soon be betrayed, arrested, crucified, and killed. And so Jesus was forewarning his disciples that this betrayal, this treachery was was not coming as a surprise to him. He was expecting it. And so we've already seen that Jesus has warned us that, that betrayal is coming our way. So don't be surprised by it. He's already told us that times will go from bad to worse. We have to learn to work the muscle of betrayal so that those experiences make us stronger, not weaker. Those are opportunities for us to do the right thing, even when people are doing the wrong thing to us. Some call it taking the high road. That's a good word for it. That's a good expression. Some describe it as don't lower yourself to that person's uh, level. That's a good way to put it, too. And those are good expressions about how we should handle these times of conflict. So that we, uh, we, we can still guard our hearts. Uh, we can set boundaries with unsafe people in our lives. Uh, but we still love deeply. We don't let the fear of being hurt hinder us from being close to others. So our challenge as followers of Christ is to watch our level of loyalty. Are we too easily offended? Uh, do we look for the worst in people instead of looking for the best. Don't let those people crush your faith in God. It's easy to blame him or her. It's easy to let betrayers sap our joy and take our peace. But the reality is that those people were what they needed to be for that time in our lives. If they had not left, we would still be stuck to them. And so what's happening spiritually is that there are some lessons that needed to be learned. In that season of our lives, we needed to pass that test. And it's easy from a human perspective to take it out on that person. It's easy to, to bottle up the anger and, and let it turn into the acid of bitterness. But we, uh, uh, we believe, we as followers of Christ, we believe that our God is sovereign over all things. And if that's true, then we have to learn to trust that his ways are best. If somebody, if somebody leaves us, it was time for them to go. I mean, maybe we did our best to reconcile. We did our best to forgive. We did our best to make amends or whatever it was. But if they're just determined on leaving, then it was time for them to go. There are things coming down the road that would not be able to happen had that person still been in your life. That's faith. We believe that our God is still in control even when our world is falling apart. He is omnipotent. He is omniscient. And he knows what will happen before it happens. 
And that, you see this so vividly in this example here with, uh, with Judas, Jesus and Judas. Uh, and Matthew 26, 14 tells us that Judas had already met with the religious leaders. And then one of the 12, whose name was Judas Iscariot, it says in uh, Matthew 26, 14, went to the chief priests and said, what will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray him. So Jesus knew that Judas was doing wrong, and Jesus wanted to use that supernatural foreknowledge to help reinforce the faith of the rest of his disciples. Uh, so he wanted them to understand that Jesus wasn't defenseless in this. He wasn't a victim. He wasn't powerless. Uh, no, Jesus was powerful. And he wanted the disciples to, in the future, look back on this moment to this night and remember that he warned them about this. And that would help them see that their God had a plan. And yet, even though we may have a strong faith in our mighty God, betrayal still stings. It hurts. To be sold out, to be double-crossed, to be stabbed in the back, to, it burns when someone does you dirty. John 13, 21, after saying these things, says that after saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And it's interesting that Judas had done such a good job of lying. He was such a master deceiver that the, disi the disciples were surprised when Jesus mentioned that one of them would betray them. They were so clueless. They didn't even suspect. You know, they didn't say like, oh, we know who, like, he's right there, this guy. They didn't say that. In fact, Ju Judas was so trusted that he was their treasurer. And on top of that, John will later reveal that Judas was stealing money, was actually stealing money from them. Can you imagine? Here, here Judas had been with Jesus for three years now. And just like all the other disciples, he, he had heard Jesus teach. He'd seen him perform miracles. He'd seen him walk on water. He'd seen him raise the dead. He was there for all of it. And somewhere along the way, Judas became disillusioned with Jesus. He, like the other apostles, he wasn't alone, they all thought Jesus was going to overthrow the Roman oppressors. They all thought that they would one day have political power. And Judas was specifically looking to see how he could get rich from this deal, from this relationship. He had, he had let greed rule his heart, looking for angles to, get, to enrich himself. John 13, 22 says, The disciples looked at one another uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at the table at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. And so that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Now, Matthew, in his writing, he describes how the mood changed. There in Matthew 26, 22, he said, And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him, one after the other, Is it I, Lord? Is it I? Lord, they were shocked. And they must have all been talking to each other because even when Jesus addresses Judas, the other disciples did, still didn't know who it was. Um, they, uh, so, so think about this. Uh, they're at the table. Judas is busted. I mean, he's, G Judas knows that Jesus knows what he's done. And he continues his charade. And instead of Judas owning up to the fact that he'd already spoken to the religious leaders, listen to what Matthew uh, 26, 5 says. It says, Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? And he said to him, You have said so. But notice how Judas answered Jesus. The disciples are saying, Lord, is it I? And Judas at this point is saying, Rabbi, teacher, is it me? By this point, he'd given up. 
Judas had given up. And this is an important lesson for us because it's possible for a person to pretend to follow Jesus, but their hearts are somewhere else. Anything we give our attentions to, affections to, if we don't keep it in its proper place, in the end, it will consume and destroy us. And for those who grew up in the church, we heard stories about, about how great God is, about how we should pray and obey him. We learn that Jesus loves all the children, all the little children of the world. But as we grow, and then we have to deal with the reality of life, it's easy to get discouraged and disillusioned because we can pray to our great big God and he doesn't answer the way we wanted him to answer. We pray for a loved one to live and then they die. We see terrorists shooting, we see bombs being dropped and it's, it doesn't seem like our great, loving, powerful God is doing anything about it. And so we might start to think that we've been duped like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz that behind the curtain is someone who can't really control the outcomes, who's not really making a difference. If we're not careful, this is where our disappointment can grow into disillusionment. And this is where we have to reframe our faith and not look at anything or give our allegiance to anything above Christ. You see, Judas loved this whole idea of God and changing lives, but he didn't love Jesus. And whatever we have, whatever we have, our, our time, our talents, our treasures, we need to not let them get ahead of Christ. We can have church and still not have Christ. We can hear great sermons and still not be saved. We can come from a great family. That's not it either. We can have every opportunity and the most access at our fingertips and still have a soul that is unredeemed. No, we need to keep Jesus first, especially as life gets more confusing. Knowing what Jesus knew about the condition of Judas' heart, Jesus could have picked somebody else. Knowing that Judas had these propensities, these weaknesses, he could have chosen someone else. All of this could have been avoided. But the betrayal was necessary for the fulfillment of God's plan. And there have been people in your life who are no longer with you who were necessary for the fulfillment of God's plan for you. They were there for a season and for a reason. When their time was up, they closed their hearts. They, the lessons were learned. The rough spots had been chipped off. The pride had been humbled inside of our hearts. And it's during those moments, when we're going through times of drought, that the tree roots dig deeper into the ground. And as we look back on our dry seasons of life, those were times when you couldn't see anything happening on the surface. In fact, sometimes the tree looked dead. There was no fruit. There were no leaves on top. But down below the ground, in the unseen place, our roots were going deeper into our faith. If God doesn't take away our problem, then he'll give us the grace to endure it so that later on we become fruitful and multiply. And, and he can strengthen and empower us and so, so that our lives are productive. And this is what Judas missed completely. In John 13, 27, it says that after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. And Jesus said to him, what you are going to do, do quickly. Now, now go. Uh, now no one at the table knew why he had said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast or that he should give something uh, to the poor. So after having received the morsel of bread, uh, Judah, he, Judas immediately went out, and it was night. When bread was dipped in wine, 
It was usually given to the guest of honor, like giving a toast at a banquet. You were giving them the spotlight and holding them in high esteem. And that is the indicator that Jesus used to identify his betrayer. And so while his, he still had the taste of bread and still had the taste of wine in his lips, Judas walked away. Uh, earlier in John 13, 2, we read that during supper, when the devil had already put it in, into his heart, into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So Judas had already given himself over to Satan's plan. The devil doesn't enter into someone without an invitation. When the devil is allowed into a person's life, that door has to be opened from, from the inside. And so because Judas was already on the path to betrayal, there was no need to wait any longer. Jesus had washed his feet. The Son of God had showed him honor. And Judas was still unwilling to change. So Jesus told him to get on with what you were getting on. And even though the devil was in all this, God is still sovereign. God's plans are not thwarted by the evil one or the evil in this world. John 13, 1 says, before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. Oh. Relationships are hard. They can be tough to work through misunderstandings and conflict and confusion. But love has a long fuse. Love sometimes has to put up with difficult people. Love sometimes has to overlook a multitude of wrongs. First Peter 4, 8 says, and Jesus loved Judas to the very end. Even when you uh, uh, fast forward to the garden, there is that moment when Judas led the the soldiers there so that they could arrest Jesus. And Matthew 26, 50 says that Jesus still showed him kindness. And as he came up to him, he called, Jesus said, friend, do what you came to do. If that was me, <laughs> that's not the word I would have used. I've got some good Spanish words <laughs> that, I, that I would have said to him in that spot. But Jesus showed him so much love even after everything Judas had done, Jesus was still willing to forgive him, to show him mercy. Had Judas repented, he, he would have been forgiven. And John 18, 3 tells us that, that Jesus identified himself to Judas and the soldiers uh, who were coming with him. And that eliminated the need for the kiss of identification. But Judas went up to him anyway, the audacity of it, right? Went up to him anyway. And Judas used a symbol of love and affection to follow through with his betrayal. Jesus gave him every opportunity to change, but Jesus' heart, uh, Judas's heart was already hardened. He was set on doing what he was going to do. Uh, there's a lady named Cory Tim Boom, who was a prisoner in the concentration camps during the war with Nazi Germany. She survived the war and lived on, a, lived on well into her 80s. In fact, she, she, was, she died in 1983. She was a great Christian woman. After the war, her homeland of Holland was left to pick up the pieces, left not only in the streets, but in the hearts and, hearts and souls of the people. She would go from town to town proclaiming the good news that, that the joy that Jesus gives runs deeper than despair. She continued to speak, not only in Holland, but in other parts of Europe and the United States. But the country that needed the most healing and the message most was Germany. The country was still in ruins, cities in ashes. But more terrifying still was the emptiness and the disillusionment of the people. So Corey went back to the very country that had once held her captive. It was at a church service in Munich 
that she learned a great lesson about God's love. She spoke that day of the people's need for forgiveness and how Jesus could cleanse them from all their sin. As soon as she was done, a man who'd been a member of the SS troops approached her. She recognized him. She remembered him from the concentration camp in Ravensbrück. Every Friday, they went through the humiliation of having to strip their clothes off for a medical examination. They had to wait in long lines while grinning guards stood watch over them. Corey's sister, Betsy, died in Ravensbrück. And now here was one of her, those terrible guards standing before her. He approached her with a smile, beaming with gratitude. He said, how grateful I am for your message, Fraulein. To think, as you say, Jesus has washed my sins away. Let me read to you what happened from Corey's own words. She said, his hand was thrust out to shake mine. And I, who had spoken so often to the people the need to forgive, kept my hand at my side. Even as the angry, vengeful thought boiled through me, I saw the sin of them. Jesus Christ had died for this man. Was I going to ask for more? Lord Jesus, I prayed, forgive me and help me to forgive him. I tried to smile. I struggled to raise my hand. I could not. I felt nothing, not the slightest spark of warmth or charity. And so I breathed a silent prayer, Jesus, I cannot forgive him. Give me your forgiveness. And as I took his hand, the most incredible thing happened. She said, from my shoulder, along my arm, and through my hand, a current seemed to pass from me to him while into my heart sprang a love for the stranger that almost overwhelmed me. And so I discovered that it is not on our forgiveness any more than on our goodness that the world's healing hinges. No, the world's healing hinges on that of Jesus. When he tells us to love our enemies, he gives us, along with the command, the love itself. Mm. These are confusing times. And they'll get worse. But the darker this world becomes, the more the light of God will shine through. And this is where we have to remember why God left us here. What is our purpose? What does he want? What's our role in this world? And there's a great example of that in 1 Corinthians 2. When the Apostle Paul was writing to the church in Corinth. And he reminded them of how, what their past was and how they used to be so wrapped up in their old beliefs. And there were all those beliefs, all that worldview, that mindset was still distracting them. They had had so many different gods, so many different philosophies that they followed they came from a very polytheistic culture and there were temples to those gods that dotted the landscape of their city. And so Paul entered a, into a very complex culture in Corinth. And instead of getting into all of the different debates of the day, he said this in 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2, he said, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Christ Jesus and him crucified. So the people of Corinth would ask him, what do you think, Paul, about this God? And 
Paul would say, I don't know anything about that God. How would you reconcile, Paul, these different points of view, these different philosophies? And Paul would say, I don't know anything about that philosophy or point of view. He would say, all I know is Christ and him crucified. You see, that one thing cuts through all of the clutter. One person cuts through all of the confusion. Jesus is a man who claimed to be God. He died. And three days later, he arose from the grave. What are you going to do with that? And some might say today, well, when I was young, I went to church and it was boring. Or when I went, they were, they were too radical. Or it was filled with hypocrites. And Paul would say, I don't know about all that. All I know is Christ and him crucified. That's all you really have to reconcile. Whatever affections that filled your heart. Money, pleasure, pride power. Lay it all at the cross. Well, my loved one died and God disappointed me. Or God didn't answer my prayer when I didn't get the job or I didn't get the raise I was hoping for. Uh, lay it at the cross. Don't get confused. Cut through the clutter. Let his death, burial, and resurrection be preeminent in our hearts. That's the gospel. And that's what separates Jesus from every other religious leader or system of beliefs. We have to understand that God's kingdom is internal and eternal. He didn't come to remove us from the pain of this world. He didn't come to, to take us away from the conflict. That, there's a day coming when that all that will be true. And that's our hope and future in heaven. But for now, we live in it, in this world, in this age of grace. And we are commanded to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. A couple of years ago, I had a chance to share the gospel with some graduate students and some visiting scholars from mainland China. Uh, they, none of them knew about Christ. Some had barely heard about him. And they were curious they were here in America studying for one year before they returned. And one of the professors, uh, a pro Christian professor, asked if I would uh, say something or explain about art, because uh, they didn't know a lot about art. It was, they, they knew more about math and economics and things like that. So I, I asked the professor who set up the meeting if there was something that she wanted me to focus in on, like the Renaissance or some era or some artist. and she. Uh, some, something in particular, and she said, uh, I don't know a lot about art either, but if you would focus on anything that has the gospel in it. I cherished that. There are so many rabbit trails that we could have chased, but let's keep the main thing, the main thing. Christ and him crucified. The history of art is filled with the gospel. It was necessary for him to be betrayed and die so that we could be reconciled to God by his death, burial, and resurrection. And now all who look to him in faith for their salvation, all who trust him as Savior and Lord can find forgiveness. Judas had his chance up to the end Here's how his story ended. Matthew 27 says that when Judas who had betrayed him realized that Jesus had been condemned to die, he was filled with remorse. It's different to have remorse, to feel bad. It's different from repentance. He just felt bad about it. He didn't repent from it. It says, so he took the 30 pieces of silver back to the leading priests and the elders. I have sinned, he declared, for I have betrayed an innocent man. What do we care? They retorted, that's your problem. 
And then Judas threw the silver coins down in the temple and he went out and he hanged himself. And apparently the hanging didn't go so well. The rope must have slipped or the tree must have broken because Acts 1 tells us that Judas bought a field of the money he received for his treachery. Falling headfirst there, his body fell open, spilling out all of his intestines. This is a horrible death that Judas died. But it's nothing compared to an eternity of suffering that he'll endure separated from God. Every time we sin, we are in a sense betraying Jesus. And we all blow it from time to time. And they aren't mistakes, they aren't lapses in judgment. It's, we're guilty of sin. But no matter how great our sin, no matter how shamed we may feel, know that even, even now, Jesus offers forgiveness. He still calls us friend. He still shows us grace and mercy. And the Bible makes it very simple. And 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Glory be to his name. Let's pray together. Father, we, we don't want to be like Judas, where we are close in proximity to you, but not really know you. No, we want to know you more. We want to love you more. We want to understand you better. And we thank you for your patience with us. Thank you for your goodness and your grace. Thank you for loving us while we were still sinners. You sacrificed your only son so that we could live. And we're so thankful for that. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen.